Hello, in this video, we're going to cover 13.7, um, which is the tangent planes and the normal lines. So there's 10 questions in this uh, particular section. Again, you always wanna watch the, the lecture slides, read through those, get all of the formulas, kind of get the context of what we're doing in this section um, before coming in to the homework assignment, okay? <laughs> you could see my shadow when I'm doing my hand gestures. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so make sure you do do that, that you go look at those PDFs that are inside Canvas before coming into the assignment. Now, I did try to be like a little bit extra prepared for this uh, recording, so I kind of already written down the problems and left some spaces and whatnot, mostly because my mother called in the middle of me trying to start this video. <laughs> And so while she was talking to me, I just kind of just jotted everything down. Hopefully I've left enough space. Um, these problems are not too, too lengthy. So I think I can fit at least two of them on one page. Um, but let's just go right into it. So you'll have examples of the problems when you receive them on your homework assignment. Now, um, I don't think I've mentioned this. Um, I mean, I might have like once in the very beginning, but I think I need to start mentioning it in every single video. Um, when you do go and, and look at those unit um, those unit notes, the PDF files with um, all the slides and everything, all of those PDF files, um, you do want to try the homework, okay? Um, I would say to try it. What I don't want you to do is just take what I have and plug in the numbers that you get, okay? What I want you to do is actually try to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it, okay? Um, if you don't connect those three dots, um, chances are you're not going to understand what's being asked of you when you get to the test, okay? So it's just a matter of, of basically checking the boxes. Do you know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it, okay? Um, the lecture notes are really the explanation for the what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then this is more of like how we're doing it, okay? Um, but you do need to connect all three of those in harmony to fully understand the concepts for testing, okay? Um, so I just wanted to iterate that. Some people don't think about it all in a huge scope, right? Um, so just kind of ponder over that and make sure that when you do complete a section that you kind of Give a summary for yourself, okay? What was it that we did in this section? Why were we doing that in this section? Um, and the why may not be evident sometimes until you get to the next section, right? Because they'll teach you a skill in one section and then they'll show you how to use it in the next section or cases in which you would use it, right? And so then that answers the why, okay? So not always is it evident the, the why immediately, but ultimately you'll eventually get at the end of the unit, get to the why I was doing that particular skill in that particular section, okay? Um, and then the how, the how is always gonna be answered because it's the stuff that I'm doing in these videos where I'm actually showing you the mechanics of how the problems work out, um, what you're plugging in, how you're plugging it in. I even sometimes discuss um, the what you know, as far as like the formulas that we're using and, and the result of that formula should, what it should look like, stuff like that, okay? Um, so I just thought it was worth mentioning. Um, I, I know I haven't mentioned it in every video, but <laughs> it is definitely worth considering when you're preparing for this test. And now that we're getting in a 3.7, we're at that little hump of the section almost being over. So we've got 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, 3.10, and then it's done, okay? So definitely at this point in time, you kind of should start being able to see where we're going with this chapter. Um, you can kind of start seeing why we're doing certain things that we're doing, um, but ultimately those, those uh, why questions will be answered in uh, the later sections of chapter 13, okay? So let me get right into it. I, I apologize for spending <laughs> those few minutes on it, but I just definitely wanted to make sure that um, I, I give that information. So I was trying to look to see how much time I had wasted because in some of my videos, I have like a little timer up at the top that tells me how long I've been recording. But for some reason right here, I do not have my timer. Um, so anyway, we'll keep going. So for number one, it says, find the an equation of the tangent plane to the surface at the given point. 
So this is very much the three-dimensional representation of what we were doing in two dimensions in Cal 1, okay? In Cal 1, we would always find tangent lines, right? And we would always find um, critical points, okay? And those critical points eventually were um, used to calculate maximums and minimums, okay? And so that's essentially what's happening in here. In this section, we're learning about tangent uh, tangent values. We're learning about uh, tangent planes. In the, in the Cal 1, it was tangent lines, right? We'll even learn about normal lines. And then eventually when we get to 13.8 is when we'll start talking about maximums and minimums, okay? So you can kind of see the parallel, I can't say the word parallelism, I can't <laughs> anyway, but you can see how the two courses are starting to parallel Cal 1 and Cal 2. So a lot of the concepts that we learned in Cal 1, we're now doing those again in Cal 3, but with three dimensions instead of just two dimensions, right? Or even more than that, some of our uh, functions are in like three variables, four variables, which are beyond three dimensional spaces, okay? Um, uh, physicists will argue that Physicists will argue that there is a fourth dimension and that fourth dimension being temperature. Um, so uh, there are actual applications of functions with four um, variables, okay? There's many, many more. If you're an actuary and you're trying to calculate insurance policies, I mean like someone's age, someone's health, someone's, you know, there's a bunch of different factors, way more than just four that would help determine your life um, um, expectancy and your, which is eventually used for your um, rate calculations, okay? I'm getting beyond myself. Let's start the math, right? <laughs> um, so in equation of the tangent line, so we definitely want to have our, um, our strategy for this. So the strategy is to find that gradient, okay? And then we're going to use the gradient as kind of like our normal vector. Remember back when we were in the previous chapter, you would take a, a normal vector and all of its um, components would be those coefficients of t in your uh, equation, your line equation, okay? Um, I think it was called the plane, the equation of the plane, which is basically like a linear equation in 2D, but a plane in 3D, okay? So let's first start by defining a, a function um, in terms of z. So if you were to let this, this whole thing be z equals y over x, then that would mean that you could define, I always say let, because I this is this variable is coming out of nowhere, right? This f. Um, so we're letting this thing be a function of all three variables. And if I were to minus z over, that's essentially what I'm doing is I'm letting this function be y over x minus z, okay? Once I have defined that function, then I can go ahead and start taking um, the gradient of it. And we know from the previous section that the gradient is just the uh, partial derivatives, right? So we're gonna do the gradient of capital F, this function that I have just defined, um, and let's go right into it. So if I'm doing the function or the a partial derivative with respect to x, um, this can be written as um, one over x times y minus z, okay? So when I'm doing the derivative of this term with respect to x, y is like the constant multiplier. And then I'm basically going to be taking the derivative of this. Now, I know that that is the same thing as x to the negative 1y minus z, OK? So if I were to bring down my power, it become negative 1x, decrease the power by 1. Um, that is my derivative there. And then for the next term, the derivative of z with respect to x is just 0, comma. Moving on to the derivative with respect, the partial derivative with respect to y. So here, 1 over x acts like my constant multiplier, and the derivative of y is 1, but the derivative of z with respect to y is 0, okay? Now we're going to do our third component, which is the partial derivative with respect to z. So this term has no z's in it, so it's like a constant, and the derivative of that constant is 0, and then the derivative of z is just 1. And so what I end up with is 
Um, if I clean this up, I'm not really adding anything or subtracting anything. These guys are not really there because they're just zeros, right? So I'm going to put this downstairs. This is negative y over x squared. This is just 1 over x. And then this is negative 1. Okay, so far so good. So let's go ahead and evaluate this gradient at the point that they've given me, which is 1, 5, 5. Okay, so this is like the derivative, just a regular derivative in two dimensions, right? And then in order for you to find the slope of the tangent line, you had to actually plug in your point. And so that's essentially what we're doing now is we're like trying to find the, uh, the slope of this plane, okay? But it's not really the same thing as slope. It's the normal vector, right? Um, we know that it's not one coordinate that or one value that tells us what's going on. It's going to be a, a vector that's telling us what's going on. So it's not really a, a slope per se. It's a little bit different, but it's kind of the same idea on how to calculate it, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug these values in. So I get uh, negative five for Y and one for X. Again, one for X, and that's the only variables I need to plug in. So in here, this simplifies to negative five, one, and negative one. Okay, moving on, now we're going to actually write the equation. So once you have the um, slope, then you would go in in Cal one and you would find the equation with that slope with this point, right? Um, so for us, we're gonna find the plane with this normal, it's called the normal vector, right? with this normal vector and this point, okay? So bear with me, I'm gonna do that here. So it's going to be, this is gonna be like my A, my B, and my C, and then there's my points, which are my X1, my Y1, and my Z1, okay? And so I'm gonna start going into the um, equation of a plane. So we're gonna take the A, which is negative five, and then we're gonna do X minus X1 plus B, and then y minus y1 plus c, and then uh, z minus z1. I shouldn't be writing z1, I should be plugging in the number for z1, equal to zero, right? And then if I distribute and combine my like terms, I should be able to get the equation of the plane. So I have negative 5x plus 5. Here, if I distribute the 1, I get y minus 5. If I distribute the negative 1, I get negative z plus 5 equal to 0. And then if I clean this up, it's just, um, oh, I'm going to scoot this over because I am going to have to clean it. Um, negative 5x plus y minus z. These are gonna cancel and this five I'm gonna move over. So it's a negative five. But normally when you're writing the equation of a plane, they like it in what's called like standard form, just like equations of lines in standard form. And the front number shouldn't be negative when you're writing this, the standard form, okay? So essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide everybody by negative one. And then this plane equation will be positive x, five x minus y plus z equal to positive five. And this is what I would enter into that box. So 5x minus y um, plus z equal to 5. And let's go ahead and submit it and see where we are. OK, yeah, we got a green check. Now let's move on to number two. Number two, a lot of them are pretty similar. The only difference is the function. OK, so all of them are going to have the same format. I'm going to find, I'm going to define capital F function in terms of all the variables. Then I'm going to find the gradient of F. Then I'm going to evaluate that gradient of F at the point that was given. OK, and then I'm going to use that, that uh, vector as my normal vector for the plane, the equation of the plane. OK. And then once I do that, I'm just simplifying the form of that uh, plane, okay? So we're gonna move on to number two. Again, same process, different function, okay? So in this case, I'm going to do the same thing. Again, remember this is like Z and it's gonna get subtracted over there. So I'm going to say let capital F of X, Y, and this Z equal the arctan 
of y over x minus z, okay? And so then, um, oh gosh, we're definitely going to need to remember something real quick. And that is, um, oh, it's complicated. Uh, let me write it down in another color so that it stands out. But we're going to need to know what the definition of arctan is, okay? And the definition of arctan is, is when you're trying to take the derivative with respect to whatever variable, arctan, and you've got a variable in there, okay? Um, what you get is you get u prime over one plus u squared, okay? So that's the definition of the derivative of arctan. So I'm going to use this rule here, this definition, to um, take my derivatives, okay? And if you do, for some reason on the test, if you're going to have something like this on the test, I will give you these rules because these are not rules. I mean, I memorize it because I've been teaching this class for such a long time that I, I know them, right? But not everyone does. So we definitely need to make sure that you have this formula if you were to need it, okay? So if there's no arctans or anything like that on the actual test, you won't see any of those uh, formulas on your note sheet, okay? Um, everything is pretty much basic. It's basically power rules. I don't try to throw like crazy things. Power rules, chain rules, product rules, quotient rules, um, a little bit of trig, like derivatives of sine and cosine, um, but I don't usually try to put anything crazy in there. This one's just to kind of jog back your memory of the derivative arc functions, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to see them or that they pop up very often. It's just to kind of be like, oh yeah, I remember that. I should be able to know how to do this. Oh, another one is like the derivative of one over x is ln of x, or the integral of one over or the integral of ln of x. The integral of one over x is ln of x, and the derivative of ln of x is one over x. Sorry, I said it wrong the first time. Okay, so that relationship, it's good to know that relationship as well, right? Um, okay. So moving on, let's go ahead and take this derivative, which is not going to be super easy. So when I find the gradient of capital F, um, it's going to be this fraction here. So I am going to rewrite this as arc tan of um, x to the negative one times y, which will help me so that I don't have to do a quotient rule inside of a quotient, right? Um, it just helps me to do the product rule better, okay? Um, I just prefer to do it that way. I mean, you could have a quotient rule inside a quotient rule. That's just not my preference, okay? So let's go ahead and take the derivative of these two terms with respect to x, okay? And since there is, I'm doing the derivative with respect to x, and there are x's inside this arc 10, arcta instead of arc 10, um, I am going to have to apply this, this uh, rule here, right? So we're going to take the derivative of whatever's in here. And I have already done the derivative of what's in here, right? We did it up there. Didn't I have y over x? And I had to take the derivative of it. And I already know what it's going to be, OK? So I mean, I, could, I personally would just be like, oh, I already did it. So let me just plug it in. But I'm going to go from scratch just so you can see what I'm talking about, OK? So let's do the numerator. We're going to take the derivative of this, of what's inside here, okay? So we're going to take y is the constant multiplier, and then the derivative of this is negative 1, x to the negative 2. Um, and that's pretty much it for the derivative inside here, okay? Then at the bottom, I'm going to have 1 plus this thing squared. So it's x to the negative 1, y squared, okay? So it turns out I didn't need such a huge fraction. Then I do have to take the derivative of that term with respect to zero, which I mean, with respect to X, which is zero. So now we're going to do the derivative with respect to Y. And I do have Y's inside this arc 10. So I am going to have to apply this rule. Now the derivative of this angle is actually X to the negative one times one. And then if I go down here, it's gonna be one plus the angle squared. Then the derivative of the second term with respect to y is just zero. Now the derivative of this first term with respect to z is just zero because there's no z's in that first term. It's like a big, giant, ugly constant, right? Then you have the derivative of z, which is one. 
And so if I clean these up, which are going to take quite a bit of work to clean these up, okay, um, I'm going to write the numerator as negative y over x squared. And at the bottom, I'm going to write 1 plus, this will be y squared. And then this will be x to the negative 2, which will be downstairs as x squared, okay? Minus 0 doesn't do anything. Here I get x to the negative 1, which can be written as just 1 over x. And then I have 1 plus that guy will be negative, so x squared at the bottom, and y squared is just y squared. And I don't need the minus 0, and then here I just have minus 1. So then if I multiply every single term in this fraction by x squared, this will be an equivalent of saying negative y over x squared plus y squared. If I do the same thing to this fraction, multiply everybody by x squared, which is the common denominator here, I will end up with x over x squared plus y squared. And then this is just negative 1. So it's going to stay just like that. Let me move up my paper a little bit so you can see everything. So now that that's like as clean and as pretty as it's going to get, we're going to go ahead and plug in our point so that we can get this um, normal curve, normal uh, vector. So the point is 7, 0, 0. So x is 7, y is 0, z is 0. I don't see any z's, so we won't be plugging in this particular 0, but I do see some y's, so I will be plugging in that 0. So I get negative 0 over... Um, 7 squared plus 0 squared. Here I get 7 over 7 squared plus 0 squared, and then just negative 1. If I simplify 0 over anything, it's just 0. And then 7 over 49 is actually 1 over 7. It reduces. And so then I get this. This is my normal vector. So there's my a, there's my b, and my c that I need to write the equation of the plane. Now I'm going to go and write the equation of the plane. So a, which is 0, x minus the x coordinate, which is 7, plus the b, which is 7, 1 over 7, and then y minus the y coordinate, plus um, c, which is negative 1, times z minus the z coordinate equal to 0. Okay, and if I clean this up, is 0 times anything is all 0. This would be 1 over 7y. Now you can't see that. I'm going to turn the camera a little bit. So we get 1 over 7y. And then here we get minus z equal to 0. Again, the standard form, as well as this first guy being positive, we also like that first guy to be a, an integer. Okay. So I'm, it's a fraction right now, which is not an integer. So I'm going to multiply everybody by the common denominator 7. And what happens is, is that this becomes 1y minus 7, 0, still equal to 0. And I'm going to type that in here. So y minus 7z equal to 0. And let's see if I get the green check. I always get so nervous. Even though I know this stuff and I do it all the time, I make mistakes just like everyone else. <laughs> I always get nervous whenever I try to submit an answer. Um, as I'm sure you guys experienced too, right? You're like, I just worked really hard on that problem and please be right. <laughs> I don't want to have to redo it again, right? Um, so I completely sympathize in that regard. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So this is not any different, right? The directions are exactly the same. They're asking us to find an equation of the tangent plane. It's just a different function, okay? Um, I don't think that things are going to get different for us until we move quite a bit down. Um, part number five is actually asking us the same thing, except they ask us for a little bit extra, which is the symmetric equations for it. Um, this is the exact same thing as number five. That's the exact same thing as number five, just again, different functions. Here, they're getting a little bit more complicated. Know that I have three variables here. So when I set up capital F, it's gonna have four variables in it, right? Um, it is, no, actually it won't because I only have a constant over here on this side. I don't have f of x equals this, this, or that, okay? So it's not as complicated. Um, and then the last two problems are asking us for the angle of inclination, which is another formula, okay? So pretty much it's the same stuff, just practice with all the different kinds of functions, okay? So we'll just go through the mechanics and get these problems done. 
So in this case, again, this is like Z, and we're gonna move the Z over there. So I'm gonna say let capital F of X, Y, and this Z that we threw in equal to this function. Okay, so that you have all of your variables in the picture. And then now we're going to find the gradient of F, which may not be so complicated because it looks like it's just a bunch of power rules. So the derivative with respect to X is going to be two X minus two Y and then zero, zero. Derivative with respect to Y is gonna be zero minus two X plus two Y and zero. And the derivative with respect to Z is zero, 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 negative one. Um, there's really nothing to clean up there. It's pretty nice and simple and cleaned up already. So we're just going to go ahead and plug in our point. So X is five. So this would be 10 take away Y is eight. So this would be 16. Again, X is five. So this would be negative 10. This is eight. So it would be plus 16 and then your negative one. And if I clean that up, I get negative six, positive six, and negative one. So then now these are my A, my B, and my C for my normal vector. So I'm gonna go ahead and we over here, there we go. Now we're gonna go ahead and, um, and figure this thing out. So let's keep going. So I'm gonna have A, which is negative six, times x minus five um, plus positive six, y minus eight plus negative one times z minus nine equal to zero. So this is going to become um, negative six x positive 30. This is gonna be positive six y negative 48 negative z and then positive nine equal to zero. So let's see, that will become negative six X, positive six Y, negative Z. And then I'm not sure that would be negative 18 plus nine is negative nine equal to zero. I've got a couple more manipulations to do. I want the number in front to be positive and I want this guy to move over, okay? So I'm gonna have two transformations I need to do. I can do them personally in one step, but not everybody can. So I am gonna show both steps, okay? So if I make this guy, everybody's gonna change sign. So it's gonna be six, negative six Y plus Z plus nine equal to zero. And then I gotta move the nine over. So now it's gonna go back to negative, but it's gonna be on the other side. Okay, and then this is what I'm going to type into the computer. It looks like I didn't leave myself enough space on that problem, but I just somehow squished it all in there. And it's still pretty legible, so I'm actually kind of proud of myself right there, but anyway. Um, plus Z equals negative nine. Can you tell I've had coffee this morning? <laughs> I feel like my mouth is moving at a 10 miles per hour. Okay, probably more like 100 miles per hour, but anyway. So number uh, three, we got it down. I was looking at it like, wait a minute, I just do number four, but no, um, I just got all the way down to right there. Again, we're gonna repeat the process, different function. It's not too complicated, this one either. Um, so before I define my function, I am gonna have to move this 10 over. So it's gonna be minus 10 equal to zero. And so that means I'm actually going to still have only three variables. So I'm going to let capital F be a function of X, Y, and Z. And that function is going to be X, Y squared plus 3X minus Z squared minus 10. Okay, and that's because we had to move the 10 over. Okay, now we're going to take the gradient of F and that is going to be um, Y squared plus three, zero, zero. Derivative of, with respect to y, is going to be two x y, zero, zero, zero. Derivative with respect to z is gonna be zero, zero, negative two z, and zero. So then now if I wanna find the gradient, I don't know where to go with myself, let me see. The gradient of f 
evaluated at the point. Yep, okay. So y is going to be negative four. Well, negative four squared is actually a positive 16 and positive 16 plus three is 19. Then two times one times negative four is actually negative eight. And then negative two times three is a negative six. And so again, this is my normal vector. So this is acting like my A, B, and C. So I'm gonna have for my plane, 19 times X minus one minus eight times X minus a negative four. Um, and then negative six times uh, Z. Oh gosh, I put X, it should be Y. And then here it should be Z minus the Z coordinate equal to zero. Now remember double negatives is just like a big giant plus sign, right? So this is 19 X minus 19 minus eight Y minus 32 minus six Z plus 18 equal to zero. So then I get 19 X minus eight Y minus six Z. And I'm gonna go backwards with the constant. So positive 18 and negative 32 Oh gosh, never mind. I'm just going to do it in the calculator. So let's see. Negative 19 plus 32. Mm, nope. Negative 19 minus 32 plus 18. I get negative 33. Now, this guy is an integer and it's positive, so I don't need to move or multiply by negatives or anything crazy. I'm just going to move the 33 over. So I get 19x minus 8y minus 6z equal to a positive 33. And this is what I'm going to enter. Um, and then let's go see how we did. So 19x um, minus 8y minus 6z equal to 33. Think. Okay, we got our check. So now we're going to move on to number five. And number five is exactly the same thing. So I'm going to do everything that I've been doing, the same process, different function, right? The only thing I'm going to do also is instead of just doing the equation of the plane like this, I'm also going to do the symmetrical equations for the plane. Okay. So we'll. Um, We'll go ahead and do that. Now, um, let's go see what we get. Now, I am going to have to minus the 12 and put it over here, but I'm still only going to have these three variables. So I'm going to say let capital F be. Um, F is not a vector, I don't know what I'm doing there. Let capital F be a function of X, Y, and Z. And that function is gonna be X plus Y plus Z minus 12. So then the gradient of F is going to be um, one, 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 and that's it. Oh, no, yep, that's right. I was like, the Z should be negative, but no, it's not. So then that's fine. I don't even need to plug in my number because there's no X's, Y's, or Z's to plug the number into. So even evaluated at this particular number, I still get the same vector one, one, one. And this is like my A, my B, and my C. So when I write out the equation of the plane, it's gonna be A times X minus the X coordinate plus B times Y minus the Y coordinate plus C times Z minus the z coordinate equal to zero. So I get x minus three plus y minus four plus z minus five equal to zero. I get x plus y plus z, and then this is negative seven, and that would make negative 12. And then I'm just gonna move the 12 over, and would you look at that, it is tangent to itself. Why is that? Because it is the, the plane, right? x, y plus z equal to 12 is a plane. So of course, a tangent plane is going to be the exact same plane, okay? <laughs> so I bet you weren't expecting that, right? Um, but yes, if you think about it, honestly, this is the equation of a plane, right? You have all uh, variables with the power of one. Um, and so it is a definition of a plane. It's kind of like in regular two dimensions, if there were no exponents, you knew it was the equation of a line. 
Well, here, when there's no exponents on your variables, there's no fractions, there's no radicals, there's nothing crazy, um, you're going to end up with the equation of a plane. And so no matter what, that plane is going to be tangent to itself, okay? Just like a line is um, tangent to itself in two dimensions. But we do still need to write those symmetrical equations. So I'm going to go over here to the side and write those symmetrical equations. So for x, it's going to be um, x minus the x coordinate equals to at, um, which means that t equals x minus 3. Then y minus the y coordinate equal to bt, which means t equals y minus 4. And then z minus the z coordinate equals ct, which means t equals z minus 5. And so then if t equals all of these guys, then all of those guys should equal each other. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to type the first one in. I think I've got that all in there. And then now I'm going to type in the symmetrical equations, which I think is this one. Yes, let's check. Okay, we got that one out of the way. Now we can move on to number six. So I'm pretty sure that that's not gonna happen again on number six. And of course they did not give us a plane, right? And how do we know that? Because they're squares, okay? They're not linear. Um, so we know that it's not an equation of a plane, it's more of an equation to an actual surface. Um, now, sorry, I was trying to stop myself from yawning on camera. <laughs> Um, it's early in the morning, so give me a little break there. Um, so I had a bunch of coffee because it's very early in the morning. And it's on Saturday, so I'm trying. Um, num, 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 num. We're going to go through the same process. I'm going to have to move this guy over, but I'm still going to have three variables. So I'm going to let capital F be a function of F, Y, and Z, and that function will be X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared minus 26. Then if I'm gonna find the gradient of that function, it's going to be two X and two Y and two Z, and that's it. Um, if I'm going to evaluate this function, this uh, gradient at the point, that's going to give me the vector um, two, six, and eight. So this is gonna be my A, B, and C. So in the plane equation of a plane, it's gonna be two times X minus one, plus six times X minus three, plus eight times, um, why do I keep putting X twice? Each respective variable, right? Equal to zero. So I get 2x minus 2 plus 6y minus 18 plus 8z minus 32 equal to 0. I get 2x plus 6y plus 8z minus um, these two together make 40, 50, so 52. And then if I move the 52 over, I do have the standard form. Um, because this is not, none of them are, are fractions or anything crazy, and this is positive, okay? Now I'm going to go ahead and do the symmetrical equations, which means x minus 1 equals at, y minus 3 equals bt, and um, z minus 4 equals at. And so if I solve for t, I'm going to get x minus 1 over 2 equals t, here I'm going to get y minus 3 over 6 equals t. And over here I'm going to get z minus 4 over 8 equals t. So if I um, if I keep going over here, this is going to tell me the symmetrical equations of this. Okay. Now, if you notice, none of my options have these, okay? None of them. None of them have two, six, and eight in the denominator. And the reason is, is because both this function or this equation and the symmetric equations can all be reduced, okay? 
Here, it's pretty evident that everybody's even, so I could reduce everybody by two. And if I divided every single person by two, I would get x plus 3y plus 4z equal to 26, I believe. 52 divided by two, yes, 26, okay? So that's great and all. So that's what I'm gonna type, the reduced fraction, right? Or equation. Now here, it's the same thing, but except I'm dividing by these numbers. So here to reduce it, I'm actually gonna multiply by two. And then what happens is that the two is gonna reduce there and become a one. The two is gonna reduce here and the bottom will become a three and everything will reduce by two here and the bottom will become a four. So the symmetrical equations would become x minus one over one, y minus three over three, and z minus four over four. And so these are the symmetrical equations and I do see those over here in the options, okay? But bear with me while I plug in my equation. So you may not know to do that and it's perfectly okay not to do it. Like I, this is also an acceptable answer and this is also an acceptable answer. And if for some reason on a test, if it's an open-ended question where you have to type in your answer, um, you don't have to reduce them. You could leave them the way they are unreduced, okay? Um, but typically in math, if you can reduce, you should, okay? Um, that's just the way math is, is if it can be reduced, you are required to reduce it, okay? So that's why when you see in a multiple choice um, test, they will always have those uh, equations or solutions or whatever they are completely simplified, okay? And so in order for us to get one that looked exactly like their options, we did have to reduce it. Now, moment of truth, let's make sure this is actually correct. I'm pretty confident it was because I had an option that was in there, but yeah, we got our checks. Now, number seven. So number seven, we have, um, we're gonna, well, this time we have to move Z over there. So we will have X, Y, and Z. So we're gonna say let capital F, um, I might keep trying to make F a, a vector. It is not a vector, it is a scalar function. Um, so X, Y, and Z, will be x squared minus y squared minus z. And then the gradient of f would be um, 2x comma negative 2y comma negative 1. Now you notice I'm getting faster at doing those partial derivatives. You should be that fast eventually of doing partial derivatives, okay? I want you to be that fast because this is just a little minor step in like the scope of the whole entire problem. And right now it seems like, oh yeah, you're doing all this work. This looks like a lot of work, right? It's like the bare minimum beginning of another problem in another section, okay? So <laughs> and they're just trying to like get you little by little progress to where you need to be, okay? Um, but as you're moving along, you do wanna get those tips and tricks and, and, and be able to see things and do things a lot quicker, okay? Um, let's evaluate this gradient of F at the point they gave me. So two times seven is 14, negative two times three is negative six, and then there's nowhere to plug in the Z, so the Z court or the third component is still just negative one. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and find the equation. So remember, this is my A, B, and C. So I'm going to have 14 times X minus seven, minus six times Y minus three, minus one times z minus 40 equal to zero. So I get 14x minus what on earth? I think it's 98. 14 times seven, yay, 98. Minus six y plus 18 minus z plus 40 equal to zero. So negative 98 plus 18 is 80. And then if I add 40, I get, or negative 80. And then when I add 40, I get negative 40. So we end up with this. And if I move the 40 over, oh, what am I doing there? I get 14X minus 6Y minus Z equal to 40. Now you might ask yourself, well, hey, in the last one I just had to reduce, do I have to reduce here? No. Why? Because not all of these numbers can be divided by two. This one only has a one coefficient. So you cannot reduce this one, okay? 
So more than likely when we do the symmetrical equations, we will not be able to reduce, okay? So for the symmetrical equations, it's going to be x minus the x coordinate equal to a t, um, y minus the y coordinate equal to b t, and then z minus the z coordinate, which is 40, equal to negative 1 t. Now here, I may have to bleed in. Let me just scoot this over, and then I can do this again. So here, this means t is going to equal x minus 7 over 14. Here, t is going to equal y minus 3 over negative 6. And here, t is going to equal z minus 40 over negative 1. Now, remember that you can, uh, well, that one doesn't need to be worked with. But here, you can take the negative and apply it to everybody upstairs instead of to the number that's downstairs. If I do that, that becomes negative y plus three over positive six, which can be written as three minus y over six, okay? Oh, but it doesn't look like that's necessary because most of the time they like our, our denominator to be uh, positive, which is why I was going in this route, but it doesn't look like they demanded that in my solutions because don't I have an option that says x minus seven over 14, y minus 3 over negative 6 and 7 or z minus 40 over negative 1. I do have an option with those negative values down there. So I don't need to convert it to make it look more formal. Sometimes this computer is really confusing because sometimes it wants it to look real pretty and formal and then sometimes it doesn't. But I definitely need to enter in my equation. Type that in there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. It's like 26. Where did 26 come from? But it was that one. Okay. Moving on, number eight. So I'm going to turn my camera a little bit because it's not going to show you the whole rest of the page. Um, but let's get this going. Sorry, I'm losing focus. I think my coffee is wearing out. Now, when I minus the 12 over, I am going to still have um, three variables. So I'm going to say let capital F again with the vector thing. Um, I just really want to make that guy a vector for some reason. I don't know, whatever. Um, that's capital F. Now let's find the gradient of this F. And so that's going to be for the derivative with respect to x, that's going to be yz minus 0. The derivative with respect to y is going to be xz minus 0. And the derivative with respect to z is just going to be xy minus 0. Then if I want to evaluate this function at the point they gave me, which was 1, 3, 4, um, it's going to be y times z, which is 12 x times z, which is 4, and then x times y, which is 3. And so then this is my a, b, and c for my equations. So I have 12 times x minus 1 plus 4 times y minus 3 plus 3 times z minus 4 equal to 0, which is 12x minus 12 plus 4y minus 12 plus 3z minus 12 equal to 0. And then if I move that 36 over, I'm going to get this function. Now, can that function be reduced? No. I can't divide by 3 because this guy is not divisible by 3. And I can't divide by 4 because that term is not divisible by 4. So this is not going to simplify any better than it already is. Okay, But let's go do our symmetrical equations. So we get um, x minus 1 equal to 12t which is the same as t equal to x minus 1 over 12. Um, y minus 
3 equal to 4t, which is the same as t equal to y minus 3 over 4. And then z minus 4 equal to ct. And that gives me t equal to z minus 4 over 3, which gives me the symmetrical equations x minus 1 over 12, y minus 3 over 4, and z minus 4 over 3. Okay, let's see. 12x plus 4y plus 3z equal to 36. And then at the bottom, we're going to pick, no, those are a bunch of pluses. Here we go. Oh, I think it's this one. Okay, so far so good. So um, now we're going to go ahead and get into um, the last two questions, which have to do with the angle of inclination. And so if you looked in the notes, you would have found a formula that says something like cosine of theta equals um, Hmm. Let me go find that formula for me real quick because I do not remember it. That is just one of the things that we don't use a whole bunch. Um, if you're trying to graph it or, you know, you're just trying to like get a sense of what it looks like in space, knowing the angle of inclination, may, what am I doing, um, may be useful. But typically with three-dimensional stuff, we don't, I mean, as far as like us in this class, we don't always um, know exactly what it looks like before we start messing around with it and applying theorems and formulas and such. So this is not something that I do all the time, um, but it is something that may need to be done at some point in time if you're really trying to visualize where the plane is and what it looks like, okay? So bear with me, I'm gonna go try to find that formula for us. Oh, and I just disappeared everything. Um, there it is, the angle of inclination, that's what I was looking for. Okay, and so then K. K, yes. K depends on, um, Is normal to the tangent and k is normal to the xy plane. Um, normal basically means um, orthogonal kind of. Orthogonal is really used in just just plotting vectors, okay? Um, but it's really like something that is orthogonal to the whole plane. So it's it's moving off of the plane. Um, and it could be going up or it could be going down. It really just depends on where the plane is. And um, so it, it's just really complicated. But what I do want you to notice is I want you to pay attention to um, the sine of Z. And to your function that you have. So I'll explain that. So since we're gonna have to, let me first write down the formula. Here I am getting ahead of myself and I haven't even written down the formula. But the formula is the absolute value of your normal vector dot product with the K vector. And so it is literally just a vector in its uh, IJK format. So I'm going to write the same formula, but in the um, component form and you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? So in component form, this is going to be your A, B, C vector, and then K written in component form is 0, 0, 1. 
okay? So it's always going to be, if you've got this plane, right, and it's in the X, Y system, then your normal vector needs to come off of that. And normally when it comes off, it usually just goes up. And so that's why they're using this K value here. And then of course you wanna find the magnitude of that A, B, and C, oops. And then the magnitude of that K, but I know what the magnitude of K is, right? It's just one. So that's why at the bottom, you'll notice in that second variation on my screen over here, it just has the uh, magnitude of the normal vector. Okay, but we have to find that A, B, and C, and that's what we've been doing this entire time. So let's go ahead and do that just like we have been doing all this time. Now, this function is already equal to zero. So I do have X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to let capital F of X, Y, and Z equal 2XY minus Z cubed. And if I find the gradient of F, um, See, there I am again putting it as a vector. <laughs> I don't know why I keep doing this. This is like the 10th time I've done or ninth time I've done it. Um, we get, let's see, 2y and then 2x and then negative 3 squared. So if I take that same gradient and I plug in the point they gave me, which I did not write on my paper, 2, 2, and 2, I get four, four, and four times negative three, which is negative 12. Okay, cool. So then once I have that, that is my A, B, and C. So when I go to plug in my function, I know that my theta is gonna be the cosine inverse of this computation. So it's going to be um, four, four, negative 12 dot product with the K vector, which is zero, zero, one over the magnitude of um, four, four and negative 12. So then I'm gonna have cosine inverse of um, four times zero is zero, four times zero is zero and negative 12 times one is negative 12 over the square root of 16 plus 16 plus 144, which is equal to the cosine inverse of negative 12 over the square root of 16 plus 16 plus 144 is 176. And then if I do the cosine inverse of that number, negative 12 over the square root of 176, close that and make sure that my mode, because this is in degrees, I see the little dis degree symbol in my box. So I'm gonna make sure that I have my um, degree symbol here. Let's see real quick. Um, let me see, 176, I'm having, oops, delete, delete, square root. Okay, I end up with theta equal to 154 point 76 degrees. This is what it's telling me, okay, that the angle is here. However, if you look, this is more of like a reference angle, okay? So I always like to write REF because it may not be the exact answer, okay? It's just a reference angle. But if I go look, 1 over 54 is over here somewhere, okay? And, but if you, if you pay attention, your point is in 222, two, two, right? I know I'm talking about three-dimensional space, but you get my idea, right? This, if I just look at these two coordinates in the XY plane, it should be over here, okay? And so then what I wanna know is I wanna know what the angle should be here, okay? That is real easy to figure out. All I have to do is take uh, 180 minus this value so 180 minus 154.76 is actually 25.24 degrees. So this is my actual angle. 
Let's go try to plug that in and see if they want that or if I am completely wrong and the angle should be 154.76 degrees. I just have a feeling that it's not. Yep, see, I told you. <laughs> um, just because it didn't make sense to me as far as like visually where I am in, where I am in space, okay? So I wouldn't say that this is exactly the angle cosine. It's more of like the reference angle for, for the angle, okay? Um, let's do the same thing though again for this. So that wasn't too, too lengthy, but we're gonna repeat the process. I'm gonna move the seven over, but notice that I only have two variables. Um, the, the main thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is it should be in space. So you should have a third dimension. So it will be um, at least a third dimension, right? So I'm gonna say let capital F equal, this hasn't happened to us yet, but it does have to be in three variables or more. So it's basically gonna be x squared plus y squared uh, minus 17. And then when I go to do the gradient of f, it is going to be, and why does it have to be in three dimensions? Aren't I gonna have to multiply by something in three dimensions, right? I'm gonna have to have a vector over here that's in three, three coordinates. So, this uh, gradient needs to be in three coordinates. So the gradient is gonna be two X, two Y, and there's no Z, so just zero. Then the gradient of the function evaluated at the point they gave me is going to be two, eight, and zero. So this is my A, B, and C. So then I know that my reference angle is gonna be cosine inverse of two, eight, zero, dot product with zero, zero, one, over the magnitude of 280. So what is that going to look like? That's going to be 2 times 0, 0, 8 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, over who cares what the bottom is, right? Because when you have 0 over anything, it's just 0. And cosine inverse of 0 is equal to um, 90 degrees. And if we think of our coordinates, this is in positive x, y coordinate and 90 degrees is in, um, it's not necessarily in the positive, but it's up here, which is pretty much your x is positive or neutral at zero, right? And your y coordinate is positive. So we are gonna enter this 90 in there. I think that is the exact answer that they're looking for. Yep, and we got this one correct. So we are good there. Well, that is the end of 13.7. So um, we will discuss in the next video 13.8. Um, but definitely review this video so you can have an idea of what to expect on your homework. Again, you want to attempt the homework on your own, um, but definitely use this as reference. Have a good day.